Good afternoon and welcome to today's presentation, Ergonomics and Anthropometry. The information presented by the expert is not to be used as legal advice and does not indicate a working relationship with the expert. All materials obtained from this presentation are merely for educational purposes and should not be used in a court of law since the expert's consent, i.e. a business relationship where she or he is hired for your particular case. In today's webinar, Mr. Potor will discuss introduction, risk factors, examples, anthropometry, understanding issues, and best practices. To give you a little background about our presenter, Tim Potworth is a certified industrial ergonomist with more than 26 years of experience consulting, including more than two years internally at the Aluminum Company of America and more than 22 years on a global basis at Zurich Services Corporation. He also founded his own risk consulting firm, QP3 Ergo Systems LLC. Tim has worked with thousands of client locations around the world and has identified common themes that affect the ability of employees to work comfortably and safely and develop programs, plans, and options to help clients improve. He has presented at numerous professional ergonomics and safety conferences and written articles for publications including the Contact Center Pipeline, Industrial and Systems Engineering, and Iron and Steel Technology. Attendees who require a passcode, the word for today is ergonomics. During the Q&A session, we ask that you enter this passcode into the Q&A widget for CLE reporting purposes. The Q&A is located to the left of your screen. Please remember that if you are applying for CLE credit, you must log on to your computer as yourself and stay for the full 60 minutes. You are also required to complete the survey at the end of the program. Please note that CLE credit cannot be given to those watching together on a single computer. Tomorrow morning, we will send out an email with a link to the archived recording of the webinar. The slides can be downloaded from the resource list at the bottom of your screen. Thank you all for attending today, and Tim, the presentation is now turned over to you. Thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. I'm glad you're here. Uh, today, as, as Warren mentioned, we are going to be talking about ergonomics and anthropometry. Um, when you look at the term ergonomics, if we break it down into the roots, um, we can call it the study of work, and if we take it a step further, we talk about ergonomics as designing things within people's or users' capabilities. And those are some key components, the key aspects of ergonomics, designing things within people's capabilities. It could be an automobile that we drive that has an adjustable seat. That's a product that is designed within a user's capability. However, today we're going to be talking more about things in a, in a work-related environment that may or may not be designed within a person's physical capabilities. Now, ergonomics is, is something that's been around for a long time. Um, there's a lot of history with the military looking at efficiency, looking at how pilots respond and react to different stimuli. But in most cases, for most engineers, it's considered an elective in college curriculums. And oftentimes with processes and equipment and tools, ergonomics is not necessarily considered. Again, it is that elective that many disciplines do not require an engineer to take. Now, we do have a lot of talented engineers out there, professional engineers. Um, they do a wonderful job of, of creating efficient processes to, to get the most out of materials and equipment. And one of the challenges we see, and I've, I've spoken with other engineers as well, is that there's no people component. A lot of times folks are looking at the process only, and we'll talk about a few, few things, a few, few issues that result. Because what happens is we see work-related illnesses and injuries. When the person or the people component is ignored, again, the, the focus is on the process or the product, and we just don't see that safe work environment. We, that's where we start to see work-related illnesses and injuries. And I have many examples uh, that I've seen over the years where lack of attention to this human component has caused problems. This is reality. 
This is a photograph I took a while back. As you can see, this is the, the person that has to bend to to work to walk underneath the equipment. The equipment was set up. The the height was set up for the average height person. There was no consideration that this was a walkway except for what we will design for the average person. But that doesn't work if I'm a six foot three person and the average person is five foot six for whom this walk through walkway was designed. We also look at various risk factors in ergonomics. And if you look at the top top bubble, we look at awkward postures. We see force exertion. Repetition. Now, repetition is one of those risk factors. We, we hear folks talk a great deal about it. However, repetition by and of itself may or may not be a, a primary concern with work-related illness or injury. We also see repetition being, being used in repetitive motion disorder, the term. And again, it's not just repetition as a risk factor. We'll talk about that more later. We'll also be discussing uh, things like um, localized contact stress. We'll be talking about vibration and some of the other risk factors that, that folks experience that cause or, and, and, help, and lead to soft tissue disorders or ergonomic-related illnesses and injuries. And what's interesting is soft tissue or ergonomic-related illnesses and injuries do not happen instantaneously. These are disorders and injuries that occur over a period of time. Could be weeks, months, sometimes even years. And an individual may not have any indication that something is wrong because, again, it's not going to be a specific event. It's, it's sort of an accumulation of physical stress over that period of time. If, for example, I am slicing an apple, then I slip and I start to bleed, it's pretty we have a specific time, date, place. We have a specific injury. We can see the blood, et cetera. However, with soft tissue injuries and illnesses, we don't necessarily have that specific time, place, or event. That doesn't mean, though, that an abnormal condition cannot result. Because what happens is, over time, again, the, the, a joint may become and stress, the tendons, the ligaments, the muscles may become irritated and damaged till at some point I may want to reach my hand above the shoulder to reach something, but my joint just does not allow me to do that. Those are the sorts of abnormal conditions we're looking at. Or I may try to reach something in the back pocket of my trousers. Again, I cannot reach that. Or, for example, I try to hold on to a coffee mug and I drop it because there's something wrong with my hand or a structure. Those are the sorts of abnormalities that can occur. And again, these are not issues that occur instantaneously, but again, over time. When we look at posture issues as risk factors, there's several, several ones we really uh, focus on. Reaching, bending, and twisting. For example, if we reach forward too far, reach behind us, we can twist the back, reach above our head, place the stress on the shoulder. We reach down and bend, it affects the back. And again, if we reach too far forward, we can actually twist our spine. When people bend too much, um, it also places increased stress on the spine. If I bend 45 degrees or more, even without lifting something, I have a 20 to 50 times greater risk for a back injury as I would than if I were standing in an, and working in an upright posture. So it significantly increases stress on our bodies when we are in an awkward, twisted, or bending posture. The interesting about twisting is researchers have found that when a person twists in conjunction with a lifting task, it significantly increases the risk for back injury because of shear forces from twisting between the vertebrae and discs of the spine. So there's a lot of there are a lot of things to consider and look for in jobs that are going to affect a person's ability to work comfortably and safely. Also, as far as conditions that may may lead to risk factors that could contribute to injuries and illnesses. 
This is an example of a photograph I took not too long ago at a rest stop um, along I-80. And if you notice the individuals reaching up over shoulder overhead height to load the vending machine. And this is a, a design issue for the vending machine where they're trying to maximize the number of vended items in that machine so they have to replenish it less frequently. The challenge, however, is with the actual person who replenishes the vending machine. And just as we cannot put a person on a rack to stretch them out to make them taller, we also cannot hire people and select employees based on their physical stature unless there's something inherently dangerous in a job that, rec that allows us to do so. So in, so in this example, we have a person working, if you, and if you see an awkward position with this one vending machine, but as you can see down the row, other vending machines have the same challenges for her. In this example, an operator is reaching to operate this, mechanic, this manual trimming device about 200,000 times every six to eight weeks. The reach is so great that they've also actually bypassed the safety latch on the trimmer handle. This results in, in infrequently, but it does happen, the actual handle just dropping down and striking the user. And again, they, they bypass the latch to try to reduce the extended reaches. So something as simple as change, looking at the work, looking at the process, and how it is has designed is going to help. By installing a mechanical trimmer instead of the manual trimmer, they can actually improve the process and eliminate those sorts of reaches. But again, it's a lack of consideration of the human element. They're looking at how can we trim these items as quickly as possible, yet without realizing that they have actually created a bottleneck and have actually created unforeseen ergonomic and safety issues with that trimmer. We look at force exertion, um, primarily we're talking about muscle forces, you know, hit when we talk about heavy pushing or pulling or lifting or lowering. And with force, we generally have greater issues when they're combined with other risk factors. Um, when I'm, I can hold about 50 pounds pretty comfortably if I have myself in an upright standing position, if my shoulders relaxed, my elbows about 90 degrees, and I have the object close to my body. However, if I try to lift that same 50 pounds three feet away from my body and it's on the floor, then the stress and risk to my spine is going to be much greater. So when we start combining risk factors, that's when we start to see greater stress on the body and greater overall risk. You know, we talked about repetition a little bit earlier, and one of the challenges we, ha we have with this risk factor is there's no dose-response relationship. We just don't know that 5,000 repetitions an hour for eight hours a day for five days a week for 50 weeks a year is going to cause an injury or illness in the hand wrist structure of this person or that person. Scientists and researchers have been attempting to identify those those dose responses, but we just don't have a, a good a good handle on that. There's also an effect on the body in that different body structures are going to determine the level of risk. For example, a person with a small or slender hand wrist structure is going to tend to be more susceptible to a hand wrist disorder than a person with a larger body structure. And if I'm performing a repetitive task, again, my, the person with that smaller, more slender wrist posture structure is going to be at more risk. And again, repetition, like we discussed with force just a few moments ago, is going to be worse with other risk factors. If I have a good, if I'm sitting at a computer workstation and I have a good, comfortable setup, my wrists are straight, and I'm, even though I'm doing it a lot of typing, I'm going to be at less risk for an injury than if 
my keyboard is too far away or if it's tilted so I have my wrists bent while I'm doing all that typing. So again, we have to look at single risk factors, but also combinations of risk factors. And, and the more risk factors a person experiences in a job task at the same time, the, generally the greater overall risk for injury or illness. Another interesting risk, risk factor is with hand arm vibration. And hand arm vibration comes from operating power tools such as grinders, chippers, drivers, drills, impact wrenches, and the like. A, a common um, tool someone might use at home would be something like a chainsaw or a push lawnmower. And there's certain there's a certain level of frequency and acceleration that combine, and then you have a dose of that frequency and acceleration with the duration of exposure that leads to physical challenges. Now, with hand-arm vibration, the, the, the challenge, the effect is that it damages the blood vessels in the hands and wrists. And over time, person, it also affects the nerves. So a person can see a, a blanching or paling of the hands and fingers because there's less blood circulation. Um, they can feel numbness and tingling in the hand because of nerve potential nerve damage. And what they can also see, and, and we really have not seen this for, for many years, but, but 100 years or so ago in, in the rock, Indiana rock quarries, we, um, doctors would see actually a development of, of gangrene in the limbs just due to the loss of circulation. Fortunately, we're better than that today, but long-term, those are the sorts of things that can happen when a person is, is um, operating a, a heavy tool. Again, grinders, chippers could be a jackhammer. Those are the sorts of things that, that uh, transfer vibration from the tool to the hands and body. There's another kind of vibration exposure called whole body vibration. And again, we have frequency and acceleration as well as dose and duration. Now, the effects of whole body vibration are different and it comes from different sources. Uh, whole body vibration could be, come from operating an industrial forklift in a facility. It could come from working, you know, operating an earth mover outside or a, or a, a steamroller, uh, a common experience we may have is we're on a, on a rough airline flight and we, are, we feel a little bit nauseous to our stomachs. Um, essentially, that's due to the vibration and, and the frequency acceleration of, of our bodies. But with whole body vibration over time, especially with a, with a consistent exposure, we see a few things. We see potential damage to internal organs from the vibration. We also see nausea. And, and upset stomachs, and over time we can see damage to the spine because at some point the spine begins to act as what we would call a biological shock absorber. And so the spine is trying to absorb the vibration to protect our organs. So those are some of the effects of whole body vibration. Uh, I've seen uh, actual industrial operations where where the equipment had so much vibration that was not properly isolated that employees were experiencing whole body vibration and symptoms of nausea and upset stomachs that at the time were mistaken for uh, exposure to carbon monoxide, but actually was affecting the vibration. Contact stress is where part of the body comes into contact with a sharp or squared edge. And what happens with, with contact stress is it affects circulation because it can affect blood vessels, it can affect nerve function if, if there are nerves that come into contact under the skin. Also, it can affect tendon and ligament use and, and functioning. So this example shows a person seated at a, a production operation and the underside of the operation contacts the upper legs and you can sort of see the piece of metal digging into to the skin of the legs. We often see this at workbench operations, whether it's an assembly operation, it could be a laboratory operation where somebody's actually contacting the edge or corner of the bench with the, with the elbows or forearms. And again, that affects the tendons at the base of the arm. And often you can see the effects, the, the engraved, if you will, ridge where that corner has 
contact to the, the body. When we talk about extreme heat, we're talking about external ambient temperatures and where the internal body temperature starts to rise. Over time, um, if the body is unable to cool itself through sweating, um, then, then the body starts to, to shut down. We have heat stress. We have, have heat stroke. Um, so be careful, especially in the hot months, make sure that folks have adequate hydration and avoiding caffeine so that the bodies have enough liquid, enough moisture and water to sweat. Um, if you remember the, uh, the case of Corey Stringer, the, the Minnesota Vikings player a number of years ago, his body temperature was something like 110 degrees when they carried him off the field because the effects of the heat from the off season um, he was not in good condition. He was not hydrating properly. And it was just a tragedy because that, that could have been avoided. We're right now, we're getting into the fall months in the upper North America. And with extreme cold, the, the body um, tends to reduce circulation to conserve heat. And when the body reduces circulation to conserve heat, it reduces circulation to the outer extremities. So the, that's why our fingers and toes tend to feel a lot colder in the winter months, especially when we're in a cold environment. And if I'm working in a cold environment, I have less circulation, and I am working in a hand wrist intensive job, then I have a greater risk for illness or injury just because my body doesn't have as much circulation as it should to heal that wear and tear that comes from that hand wrist intensive job. I like to show various examples of how people are or are not considered in the work environment. In, in this photograph, this really is not a best practice of how to sit. As you can see, the individual's spine is hunched forward for what we call a potato chip style posture. We see the, the feet hanging off the chair. There's nothing to support the feet. And there's a lot of contact stress on the underside of the thighs from the front edge of the chair. This is just not a good work environment. In this next photograph, the individual has done her best to raise the parts box so she doesn't have to lean, twist, or reach too far, but it's still not good enough. And this is an example where she's been giving nothing to hold her parts supply. And this, these are examples of situations where a lot of attention has been placed on the process. As you can see, there's a lot of equipment at the bench, but there's nothing actually to hold the parts once she's finished the process. Again, another example of how people are sometimes not considered in the whole operation. This is an interesting photograph. Again, um, it's, it's a major, major um, corporation um, working with very highly sensitive uh, components. And there's really no appropriate place for him to work. He's actually using his toolbox as a workbench and a fiber drum covered with a foam pad as his chair. I, I'm not against see, sitting when it's appropriate to sit. However, in this, in this setup, he'd actually be better off to stand because he'd be in a more upright position. And again, the, the toolbox is really not an appropriate workstation for this individual. You asked me, why are we talking about chair canisters? Well, frankly, we, we have to be careful about the casters that are placed on chairs due to, based on the floor surface the chairs are designed for. I've worked with clients that had fall issues because, they actually, because they'd actually put a hard caster for, that's appropriate for carpet on a chair being used on a tile or hard floor surface, such as in this example. When a person goes to sit down, the chair is, is more easily moved because it has a hard forecaster, and actually it can increase the risk for a person to fall. The chair would slip out from underneath, a person would fall. Now, these are issues that, in my experience, I've found that people are very 
embarrassed and reluctant to report because they don't like to admit that they fell out of their chair. But it may be due to a, an absolutely legitimate reason they had the wrong chair casters in the first place. Now, there's a big fuss going on these days about sit-stand workstation. I'm finding that and people in the office environment desire greatly to be able to have a sit-stand workstation, yet conversely in an industrial setting, I find folks who stand for the majority of the day to desire the opportunity to sit during that time. Reality and best practice is somewhere in the middle. Our bodies are meant, not meant to stand all the time, nor are our bodies meant to be seated all the time. The best reality, the best case would be sitting for part of the time, standing for the part of the time, frequently alternating between the two. That's not always possible, but that is what we would consider more of a best case scenario. In this photograph, I'm looking at another standing, a standing workstation. As you can see, the part spins are placed too low, requires the individual to side bend and reach. We have issues here with the shoulder. We have issues with the spine. We, we have a greater risk for physical issues and potential for injuries and illnesses because of the setup of this workstation. We look at tools. We, tr we use tools to enhance our strength, to reduce our effort, to improve our work posture, and to give us a better grip or grasp on, on something. And tools can be powered, tools can be manual, but the whole goal of using tools is so we use less physical effort, so it's easier on our bodies. Those are, it's very important for us to, to remember that we also need to use tools correctly. In this photo, you can see the, 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 the gripping strength, the power with which this, this tool is being gripped. You can all, because of the, the tendons that are bulging out from the forearm. You can also see the bent wrist posture, which is not what we consider a neutral or comfortable or good position. Now, the interesting fact about this photograph, the interesting fact about this tool, is that tool actually is convertible from an inline or straight handle tool to what he has now in a pistol grip style tool. If this individual were to modify the tool and turn it into an inline straight handle, he would actually eliminate that, that wrist posture and his gripping need to grip with a high force would be reduced. It's very, very interesting watching these operations. In this photograph, the, the part is set on a bench that is actually too, now too high for this individual to comfortably work. All the work he's doing is now at or above shoulder height because of the tool he has to grasp. Taking a moment for these process engineers and design engineers to look at how the job is set up can place, make, a, make a big difference in how hard or the people have to work and the physical stresses that people are exposed to. There are a lot of simple things that can be done. It's a matter of are we going to be doing it? And we'll be talking about that in the next section. One last point I wanted to mention in this section is that sharpness matters, particularly in cutting and trimming operation. I have worked with meat processing and other industries for many years. And one of the things I find is that while they perform many different cutting and trimming operations, there really is not as much focus on the tools and the sharpness of the tools as could be. So, so it's one of those things that I've had great success working with them on their, their programs to make sure people have the right tools that are in good condition, that are properly sharpened so that people use less force, less physical effort in performing those cutting and trimming operations so that in turn reduces physical stresses and helps reduce the risks for injuries. And this brings us to our question and answer session. What, what questions do we have today? 
Okay, thank you. We are now entering the Q&A session. Attendees, please enter the passcode. The passcode is ergonomics. Also, please enter any questions that you have for Tim during this time. First question we have is, do all risk factors have to occur in order for a person to experience injuries or illnesses? Thanks for the question. That's a good question. Um, <clears throat> no, we don't have to have all risk factors at one point. Um, we can have one risk factor at a time, we can have two risk factors at a time, or we can have three or four risk factors at once. But we don't have to have all those risk factors in place for a problem to occur. Next question. Isn't repetition the only risk factor to worry about? Um, actually, that's that's another good question. Um, and, and no, we again, we as I mentioned earlier, we have heard we hear a lot about repetitive motion injuries, but I rather I'd rather use the term uh, cumulative trauma disorders or work-related musculoskeletal disorders because repetition is just one risk factor, and some jobs may not have repetition but actually may have high force exertion that cause concerns, or they may have awkward postures that cause concerns, or vibration exposure, or something else. Why is it important to have the right tools? Having the right tools allows us to perform a, a job or task more efficiently, but also more safely. For example, if I am putting, putting a, a, a um, <clears throat> doing, make, building a project, say I'm, say I'm building something, I'm, I'm putting a piece of furniture together and it calls for a Phillips head screwdriver, but all I have is, is a flat point screwdriver. That may not allow me to safely grip the, the parts I'm trying to turn. It may actually cause, cause the tool to slip and result in injury or illness. So having the right tools is, is very important. I, I like to use the analogy of a person cooking, and a lot of folks like to have hobbies they like to cook. If you don't have the right, right cooking utensils and tools, it can make the job more difficult as well. Please discuss the standing and or treadmill desk. Okay, um, the standing desk and treadmill desk are two different things. The standing desk is, I presume the discussion is stand biased. And this is where a person would stand most of the day at a stand biased desk. Um, again, we discussed earlier, it, it's that we want people to be able to alternate between sitting and standing. That's why a lot of desks are, are sit stands. You can, so you can adjust them to, to be standing or you can adjust them to be sitting. The desk I, actually, I use actually is a sit stand desk so that when I choose, I can stand. When I choose, I can sit. A treadmill desk actually combines a standing desk with a treadmill type device you might find, not this, you might find not necessarily in a a gym, but, but similar to that, because generally they have lower speeds. The challenge I find with the treadmill style desk is that people have only a certain amount of information that their brains can process at once. Um, so so I, what I do not, I actually do not recommend the treadmill desk. I've actually seen individuals using these desks where, uh, and, and I'll try to describe it as best as possible. They were on a conference call, so they had phone in one hand, and they're jotting information down on a pad using the other hand, and they weren't able to concentrate enough on the walking, so they actually were straddling the belt. So they had one foot on the far right side of the belt on the, on the platform, and the left foot was on the far left side, so they're straddling, straddling the belt, and, and both hands were engaged, and they were just talking about an issue over the phone. So there's, there's a great potential for a lot of distraction here and for, for increased risk for falls. My best recommendation would be for folks who want to use a treadmill to use a treadmill um, 
not as a desk, but to use it in a fitness environment um, without a lot of external distractions and stimuli. We have time for one more question. How significant a risk is boredom or concentration fatigue? Okay, hey, it dep a lot depends on on the type of, of job a person is is performing. For example, if I'm performing an inspection task and I have a lot of products coming by me, then in a very short amount of time, in in 20 to 30 minutes, I will start to become bored. I will start to lose concentration. I will not see defects. I will not see flaws. If if a per if you spend a lot of time in airports like I do traveling to client locations and you see the security screeners, they actually rotate very rapidly about every 20 to 30 minutes. Again, so that those looking at the magnetometers and the x-ray scanners do not get so bored that they start to miss things that they should not miss. So, so absolutely, we, we need to be careful that, that folks are able to stay alert and pay attention to detail. Thank you. You continue your presentation. Thank you very much. And thank you for all the good questions. Now, when we start looking at ways people get hurt, we're looking at training issues, we're looking at design issues. If there's a hole in the ground, I can do one of two things. I can train my team, I can train my people to walk around that hole, which sometimes happens in places I visit, or we can look at the design of it and we can either fill in and eliminate the hole or cover it until it can be filled in. So it's a difference between a training and a design. The challenge with the training aspect is many times information goes into the brain and just does not stick. And so one of the things that we try to do with equipment and tools, equipment and tools, excuse me, is to set them up so that there is one way to perform a task, there's one way to use a tool or piece of equipment, so that we don't have to rely on cooperation from employees and so that there's less chance long term for people getting hurt. Another reason we see what I call poor design issues is safety reviews or lack thereof and ergonomics reviews or lack thereof. I work with, again, many clients, large and small, and frankly, safety and ergonomic reviews are often not considered or only performed on a cursory basis. What this then does long term is to increase the risk for injuries and illnesses. I do work periodically with large clients and they're a little bit more sophisticated that do require safety reviews for all incoming processes and tools and equipment and who are actually moving towards ergonomics reviews for process tools and equipment. Now the challenge is that we can say are there in a review are there ergonomics issues? Well somebody may say no, 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 no. But we have to phrase those and word those reviews carefully so that it's more along the lines of how we are designing. Are we accommodating a wide range of people? What are the forces? What are required by the operators? Those sorts of things. And I've worked with many major automakers, and I, I know in, in Detroit there's one client I've worked with that actually is incorporating ergonomics reviews into new, new plants, tools, and equipment. And, and that's long term the way we need to, what we need to see. And one of the challenges that a lot of organizations who have injuries and illnesses don't see is that there's, there's that piece missing for those reviews. And one of the things that we talked about a little bit earlier in the first section is the focus. Focus of engineers is on throughput, inefficiency. It means some, not a fault, and we don't want our process to blow up and kill people, and we don't want our process to break. We want it to keep keep rolling. Those are the main focuses 
that's where um, our challenges lie. And I've actually spoken with engineers I've done training for who said after the class, gee, I've spent 20 years designing processes and equipment, and this is the first time I've really considered the, the, the human component. So we have a lot of opportunities here and, and processes, and we can go back and look. When you put this process or piece of equipment in, did you consider the human component? Those are things we need to look at. Now, to the second portion of our, our section, the anthropometrics or anthropometry section, is and anthropometrics and anthropometry is a science that defines physical measures of person's size, form, and functional capacities. And when we apply it to occupational injury prevention, and this is an IH definition, the measurements are used to study the interaction of workers with tasks, tools, machines, vehicles, and personal protective equipment. And, and the goal is to determine the degree of protection against various exposures, whether chronic or acute. And one application of our aspect of measurements in ergonomics is designing working spaces and products and tools, with, again, with the, with by taking people's physical characteristics into consideration. Um, if you got into a car and, and drove somewhere this morning and somebody else was driving the car before you, you probably adjusted the seat, the mirror, the steering wheel, a few other things to work comfortably. That's what we're trying to do. The automakers have done a pretty good job of designing equipment, tool, their, their, their products to allow a wide range of sizes of people to operate them. And when we start talking about the sizes of people, we talk about the smallest which is about five foot, five feet tall. The average person is about five foot six. And largest or tallest is about six foot three. Now we also have the width or breadth and depth of the human body. And the, the girth, if you will, has been of people's bodies has been increasing over recent years. So those are also certain things we have to take into consideration. Airplane seats are not built for today's average adult body. They're built for adult body for several decades ago. So those are sorts of things we'll be talking about. We have gender differences. Men over, overall are, have larger statures, greater statures than, than, than do women. We have regional, cultural, and demographic differences depending on the part of the world we come from. I, I've worked again, on a global basis, and I've seen the, the, these challenges. What's also interesting is when equipment is brought from one region into another region with a different demogra uh, anthropometric demographic, and my forward reaches may be less, but maybe the equipment is actually too short for the demographic of, say, the, the Euro Northern Europe or the, or the Americas, and we have to make some adjustments adjustments here and there. So we have to be careful about regional differences and the equipment we bring in and who's designing that to, those tools and equipment. So what do we do? How do we accommodate a lot of people? We have to look at ranges. Our best practices goal in the science of ergonomics is to try to accommodate about 90% of the working population, of, again, adult men and women. That's our goal. And the goal is a range. We're not always going to be perfect, but that's what we should strive, strive to achieve. And that's one of those questions we should be asking is when something goes wrong somewhere, we should be asking, okay, what anthropometric range was this piece of equipment or this tool designed for? Something, something very, very key to consider. Some simple things to look for, we, I look for reach distances, I look for the hand height or upper hand height where I'm interacting with the process. Not necessarily the fixture height, but where are my hands going to be, what height are they going to be. Um, when I look at reach distance, that's another thing to consider is that I'm not always going to be looking from the front of the piece of equipment to where my hands end up. I actually need to pull, step back and look at the center of my body. Where, where are my shoulders? Where do my shoulders start? So from my shoulders 
to the point of operation of the hands. That's the actual reach, reach distance, not from that front of the piece of equipment. It's a very, very important thing to consider. So what can happen? If I'm working above the shoulders, as we, talk, as we spoke earlier, about earlier, I have a greater risk for a shoulder injury if my hands are working above the shoulders. If things are set up too low and I have, find myself bending on a frequent basis, then I've got a, I'm experiencing a greater risk for low back injury. If I have to reach forward again, I have a greater risk for a shoulder injury because again, it's not within that comfortable zone. A comfortable zone would be for me to be an upright or a slightly bent knee posture, my shoulder relaxed, elbows about 90 degrees and wrist straight. If you can imagine that that is where I'm strongest, that is what I consider my neutral posture where I want to be doing most of my work. Granted, there are going to be times where we have to reach below mid-thigh. There are going to be times where we have to reach above shoulder. We're trying to minimize those kinds of situations, those occurrences. Several years ago, I, had, I was asked to make a three-night, two-day trip to France to, to work with a client where they had a claim of a shoulder injury. And the French government became involved, and they were, they were very concerned about, about who was going to pay for it, if it was work-related or, or not. And so they said, okay, well, we will look at the risk factors in this operation. We found was, through the assessment, was there were frequent requirements for the individuals to work with their hands over shoulder height. We found that risk factors did exist that could contribute to the shoulder injury, and essentially their question was answered. And it took a lot of time. It'll take an on-site visit. We'll compare the. We'll take measurements. We will look at the measurements as compared to the the anthropometrics on the anthropometric tables, so we can say this is above shoulder height of this percentile of the working population. What we want to try to do, our best practices is, is to properly design tools, equipment, and properly accommodate as many people as we can. If we don't have a good design, we're not taking account people's body sizes and accommodating them for not only their, their physical size, but also the, the, the strength capabilities, then we're, we're going to see some abnormal conditions result. So you say, well, what is the anthropometric data? And, and that's a fair question. I think that's a fair question, again, to ask in any situation where there's an injury or illness is what kind of anthropometric data was used to construct this piece of equipment, what considerations were taken into account, who, do, who are we trying to design for? And frankly, one of the questions I see frequently is I will get the answer, oh, well, we were designing for the average person. And that is, that's not going to be, to me, an appropriate or acceptable answer. And in project management, we need to look at and use assessment tools. We need to assess tools based on the anthropometric jobs, based on the anthropometric tables, and we have those tools. We, we also have a few um, upper extremity the evaluation tools, there's what's called a strain index, there's called a rapid entire body assessment, ra rapid upper limb assessment. Project managers and leaders should act, perform formal reviews some of the, using some of these assessment tools and develop flexible workspaces that will accommodate, again, a wide range of the working population. I find it very important to take these steps, use these tools, again, because right now, in very few instances, are these reviews and are these assessment tools being used and implemented in that design phase of a process. I alluded to this a little bit earlier, but I'm going to read this. What EEOC tells us, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission says that height and weight requirements tend to disproportionately limit the employment opportunities of some protected groups. And unless the employer can demonstrate how the needs related to the job may be viewed as illegal under federal law. A number of states and localities actually have laws that specifically prohibit discrimination on the basis of height and weight unless based on actual job requirements. 
therefore less job related, inquiries about height and weight during the hiring process should be eliminated and avoided. In addition, reasonable accommodations to a job may be made and or required for personal limitations under the Americans with Disabilities Act. So it's very important that we look at the design of processes and equipment, that we focus not on the person, but on designing the process of equipment to have a range, to accommodate a range of sizes of people. And that's one of the great challenges that we see is many times this is not done. I can remember a case in Wisconsin about 10 or 15 years ago where an employer, a pretty well-known employer, was actually discriminating on a gender basis because of strength, because the job, some of the jobs require a certain amount of strength. And they, they did not want to make changes to the jobs to reduce the physical requirements, so they, they limited who they, they were hiring. That resulted in um, lawsuits and findings by the EEOC that were contrary to what the the company was trying to accomplish. So again, it's essentially against the law by specifying height and weight and strength requirements as well, because it's going to disproportionately limit employment opportunities for protected groups. You have to be very careful. So in, in summary, we see we need to look at inherent design issues. We need to think what criteria are being used when engineers and, and, and company, engineering companies are designing products, tools, and equipment. What kinds of considerations are being taken for the people who have to interact with that process, with that equipment? Because if we're not looking at human interaction with a process or a piece of equipment, there may be liabilities. I can't answer that question specifically, but those are fair questions. I believe many issues can be corrected and or avoided before a person actually starts working on a piece of equipment. A few years ago, I worked with a client. They were building an $80 million uh, processing operation, and I had the opportunity to work with them during the blueprint stage of this process, and we, our focus was where employees would interact with this process, with loading or unloading materials or equipment or maintaining the piece of equipment. We found around 60 action items to address while this process was in the blueprint stage, so that once it was built uh, under, under operation, there was less stress on the body, less need to come in and do retrofits or redesigns because we had taken care of things from the start. And that was a really great success, but unfortunately not all organizations think that far ahead. So those are, those are some, some things to consider, some things to think about. So what are some approaches to help improve this? We have to look at engineer training. We have to look at design guidelines, anthropometrics, how these are being applied in process and equipment design, and we have to look at ergonomics assessments. Um, that's what I do most of the time is I work with clients assessing operations, looking at tools and equipment, and comparing them to anthropometric tables, working with them in regard to how can they make improvements? How can they accommodate a wider range of the working population today? Even though they may, should, may have needed to do that six months, six years ago, but where, where, what can we do to retrofit? What can we do to make things better today with what we have? And I want to thank you all for your time and attention this afternoon. Um, I, I hope you found this helpful, and we have a few moments for some of your questions. Thank you. We're once again entering the Q&A session. Please enter your passcode during this time. The passcode is ergonomics. Also, please enter any more questions that you have for Tim. First question we have is, can you give some general suggestions on elimination of stresses created while keyboarding? Also, what type of injuries are typically expected from keyboarding? Wrist, elbow, et cetera. Okay, one of the things for keyboarding is 
have what we consider a neutral, neutral work posture. We, well, that would be my shoulders would be relaxed. My elbows would be bent about 90 degrees. My wrists would be straight. That's, that's the good rule of thumb for keyboarding. And now that assumes that the keyboard is easily accessible. I should also be sitting back in my chair so the backrest of the chair supports my body. I should bring the keyboard to me. Many times I actually see people place the keyboard on the desk surface and they hunch forward, lean forward to access the keyboard, but then over time will experience pain in the upper to mid back. So again, a lot depends on the position of the keyboard. Are we reaching and accommodating the location of the keyboard or are we making the keyboard accommodate us and bring it to us? Next question. Can you talk about the pros and cons of different computer mouse options? Pros and cons of different computer mouse options. The rule of thumb when using a computer mouse is to have a straight wrist posture. Um, I use a traditional computer mouse with a, uh, a an attached palm support so that when I move the mouse, which is wireless, my whole forearm moves. Um, there are vertical mouse devices that um, allow for more of a, a you'd call a, what you call a handshake posture. I find that those are cumbersome for me personally to use, but I know other folks. And, and clients who have used them successfully for many years. Um, if you are a right-hand dominant person or a left-hand dominant person, the, the upright or vertical style mouse pointing devices um, are designed for left-handed or right-handed. So that's, that's something to take into consideration when ordering. Um, there are obviously touchpad style mouse pointing devices and, and, and laptop computers that, that can be useful, sometimes not as, as precise, but many times uh, it depends on what works best, excuse me, for a particular individual. Uh, trackball style mouse can also be helpful. The key is to keep the wrist straight, regardless of how you operate the mouse. Um, we don't want people to flick the mouse left or right, nor do we want the, the hand to be up bent backwards, if you will, into what we would call a cobra or extended wrist posture. So again, the key is a straight wrist position. And a rule of thumb I use is, is, is no wrinkles. We don't want to see wrinkles on the wrist. What are the basic things to look for in making a typical sitting desk workspace more ergonomic? Uh, first off, we want to be seated comfortably. Um, if I'm to do that, we start off, we want the feet supported by the floor or a footrest. The next piece we want is the knees bent about 90 degrees and the thighs are roughly parallel to the floor. We want to be able to sit back into the chair so that, so that our back is supported by the backrest and we're not hunched forward. If I lean forward in my chair, then most of my upper body weight is now concentrated on my low back. If I sit back in the chair, then the, the back rest of the chair actually absorbs my upper body weight. Then, as, as we mentioned earlier, we want the shoulders relaxed, elbows about 90 degrees, and wrists straight. That is my optimal seated posture. From there, I need to see how I can manipulate my keyboard and mouse so I'm still able to achieve that comfortable seated posture. If I need to raise the chair on, so I can act that's a taller desk, then I probably need a footrest or something underneath my feet so that my feet are supported and that helps tip, tip me back into the chair again to achieve that, that, that support. Um, as far as the monitor, we should have the monitor at a comfortable viewing distance about, a, about arm's length. Uh, some people may need it closer, some people may need it farther away. For most folks who do not wear bifocal or progressive lenses, we want the top of the screen about eye level. For those of us who do, we generally need to drop the screen closer to the desk surface. Those are some, 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 some overviews and overall guidelines for good seated posture at your computer workstation. This is the last question, but related to that, are expensive ergonomic office chairs like those from Herman Miller worth it? Do you know whether the chair maker HON is quality? Um, I've seen great chairs from major 
furniture manufacturers. I've seen poor chairs from various manufacturers without commenting on specific brands. Um, I, I've seen great chairs from these manu from manufacturers. I've seen, seen substandard chairs. Generally, good chair design is a chair with a, a, a foam or padded base or seat pan, foam padded backrest of some sort that gives, it provides cushioning and support for my body. We want a seat pan that is generally flat, that does not force our, our hips or legs into a, an unnatural position. We want to be flat so that our legs are where we want them to be, not where the chair tells us to be. Um, you know, the, the Herman Millers, the steel cases, the human scales, the Hans, of the world, and, and there are many others, generally make a pretty good chair. Um, in an office environment, I have seen folks go to a big box store and purchase what I call a two-hour chair. Now, the challenge with the two-hour chairs is it's designed to only be used about two hours a day. And then, and if used more than that, they wear out very quickly, and they generally don't have very good warranty. Chairs from your major manufacturers are going to have a minimum usually of about a 10-year warranty. That's what we're trying to achieve. And in, in large-scale office, office environments, um, what I've seen in, in my own experience is testing chairs, having folks comment on them if you're looking at a large, large environment. But again, you do want to go with a major brand, um, but not all chairs are created equal, unfortunately. And I, I've seen great chairs from top chair manufacturers and I've seen poor chairs from top manufacturers. So it depends on the particular chair. Thank you for answering those questions. Any unanswered questions You're will welcome. be forwarded to for him to answer directly. Please remember that if you're applying for CLE credit, you must have attended for the full 60 minutes of the presentation. You are also required to complete the survey at the end of the program. Just a reminder that you will be receiving your certificates via email in 24 to 48 hours after the presentation. In addition to being your best source for testifying and consulting experts for more than 60 years, CASA also offers free interactive webinars, expert written articles, and research reports on expert witnesses such as the Challenge History Report 2.0 and Expert Profile 360. I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone for attending and most especially Tim Potorf for his time and effort in creating this presentation. If you would like to speak with Tim, or if you would like to speak with a TASA representative regarding an expert witness for a case that you are working on, please contact TASA 1-800-523-2319. One of my colleagues will be following up with you regarding your feedback on today's presentation. This concludes our program for today.